Hey, everybody. It's Allie, and welcome to our YNR chat for Sunday, May 20th, 2012. I have tonsillitis. <laughs> it is very painful. Very, very painful. And it affects my ability to project my voice. So although my spirit is so ready to talk about YNR in an enthusiastic, loud way, my voice, my throat just is working against me here. So I'm just, I'm snuggled up in bed with my microphone and there's unfortunately, no video component for this week. I really am sorry because I like doing the videos too, but it takes so much more to project my voice for the mic, the microphone on the video camera to pick it up, and I just don't think I can do it. So if you can bear with me, a slightly muted but no less enthusiastic Allie <laughs> here for you this week to talk about the show. So much going on, man. I... I tell you, what's really, really breaking my heart is what's going on with Tucker and Ashley. I know that not everybody is as enthusiastic about them as I am, but I am. And <sighs> clearly they both still love each other, but I don't think there's any hope. I, I mean, especially given the information that we know that Eileen Davidson is leaving YNR. I don't think we have any reason to hold out any hope that they're going to get back together anytime soon. And Ashley is taking a very hard line on all of this. She has essentially told Tucker, well, she's given him the old, if you love me, you'll stay away from me kind of line, which I hate. <laughs> I just hate. I just don't see her wavering on that whatsoever. Seeing seeing them all like this is breaking my heart, but particularly Tucker. I, I like him, and he is a ruined man. He has tried to make up with her. He's tried to explain to her. I think it was Monday's show that opened with him beating on the door of Ashley's uh, or of uh, Abby's house. It was very, um, it was very like that scene in The Graduate <laughs> where Dustin Hoffman is beating on the windows of the church. I can't remember what her name was, but he's crying out to her. It was exactly like that. It was with all, with all the emotion of that scene. And it's hard because she doesn't want to talk to him. Him, she feels like he's cheated before. He cheated on her uh, with Diane, even though he managed to wriggle his way out of it and claim that they weren't they weren't exclusive at that time. Uh, but still, ch cheating is cheating, and a cheater is, like, you know, always going to be a cheater. And in her head, she thinks that sh she's always going to be looking over her shoulder and wondering who the next person is going to be that he's going to sleep with that's not her and when is this going to happen again so i completely see her point it's just it's just so disheartening to see him and her but him i feel like ashley made tucker believe that he was a different kind of guy that he had changed that he wasn't the same mick the same playboy that he was in the past, that he could be a really good husband. And now that she doesn't believe in him, he doesn't even believe in himself. And so it's really dragged him down a couple of pegs, which I feel bad about because Tucker, he didn't have a cheating heart. He didn't do it because he had been pining for Harmony all along. He just had a stupid moment of weakness. They both did. It certainly wasn't only his fault. It was Harmony too. But it was just a moment of weakness, almost like a knee-jerk reaction to pain. Or maybe it was a pee-jerk reaction. <laughs> but it wasn't premeditated. It wasn't drawn out. He was faithful to Ashley in his heart, just not in his crotch. <laughs> and 
no one is letting him get away with it. He's paying, both he and Harmony are paying the price all the way around. Abby is being particularly vicious to Tucker. She feels that this instance has justified the way that she felt about him all along. She contended from moment one that Tucker was going to end up hurting her mother, and she, gosh, she went to extreme measures to try to stop their marriage. And now, at the first sign of trouble that Tucker has wandered, he's gone astray, Abby feels that she has been justified in all of that. And she actually encouraged Ashley to go for revenge. I'm not so sure that Ashley is not going to listen to her. I have been very proud of Abby for stepping it up and taking care of her mom. It was really nice to see her sit Ashley down and try to come up with a girl's night. She put some flowers on the coffee table and got out some different nail polishes and she gave Ashley a mani-pedi and they just, you know, she wanted to try to take her mom's mind off of this horrible thing that had just happened, which, total side note, being at Abby's house just makes me think about how well, first of all, it just makes me think about Brad. And second of all, it makes me think about how that place needs updated so badly. Abby has $500 million and she still has the same couch that Brad had. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there she has some kind of emotional attachment to it or something, but that house is so outdated. It needs a it needs a perk. It needs a facelift. We've been spending a lot of time there this week and I just can't help noticing how totally gaudy it is. I can't imagine that Abby has that tea set. There's a tea set <laughs> on a table in the background. It's a, like a blue and white tea set, and it's so not Abby's style whatsoever. That house is so not Abby's style whatsoever. I can't imagine that she hasn't decided to just politely put that tea set in a box in the attic somewhere. <laughs> Well, anyway, I I'm I was proud of Abby for sticking with her mother, but I was surprised at her suggestion that Ashley should take Tucker to the cleaners, hit him where it hurts, try to divorce him and take his money. And even though Ashley looked shocked a little bit also that Abby had suggested that, I felt that there was a little bit of a... I don't know, a, a, a twinkle in her eye as if Ashley might actually go along with that idea. So I really kind of wouldn't be surprised if Ashley went along with that and decided to take Tucker for all he's worth. Now, Tucker's not the only one who is getting a lot of flack all over the place. Harmony just feels like dog dirt. Catherine kicked her out of her house, which was very hard. Catherine has been one of Harmony's only friends and supporters, and when Catherine found out that Harmony slept with her son, she just kicked her out cold. And just everyone, uh, she just feels like she's a life ruiner. She's now ruined Neil's marriage to Sophia. She's ruined Tucker's mar marriage to Ashley. And she actually confessed to Neil there, that she slept with Tucker, which I was surprised about. There was this moment at the coffee house where Harmony's there getting a coffee and Neil sneaks in from the back and he just has this smile on his face like, guess what? <laughs> we can hang out now. We don't have to be afraid anymore. He tells Harmony that he told Sophia everything. He told her that he has feelings for her and now we don't have to be ashamed. <laughs> As if if telling Sophia was somehow going to solve everything, but now Harmony is destroyed over what she's just done. She confesses to Neil that she slept with Tucker and basically tells Neil to stay away from her. She's like, dude, I'm toxic. You don't want to have anything to do with me. I'm, oh gosh, I, her scene, she goes, just go on. I'm not, I'm not mad at you, boo. <laughs> <laughs> Just go on, forget about me. <laughs> 
Did you like my impression <laughs> of Harmony? I'm not mad at your boo. <laughs> oh boy. I was, I don't know. I heard something about that actress. She just gets me. She just just tugs on my heartstrings. And she walks out on Neil. And Neil, I think, at this point feels embarrassed. I think he feels like he dodged a bullet. It's a good thing. I mean, he doesn't know that Harmony slept with Tucker because she was trying to forget about him. He doesn't realize that part of her psychology that we realize. He just sees it as, wow, I guess she hasn't really changed at all. And as Harmony said, as if changing my name would change anything, Yolanda has always been waiting in the background, always been waiting in the wings to come make mistakes again. You know, she's starting to believe, much like Tucker, that maybe she hasn't really changed at all. And so from Neil's perspective, he, I think, starts to think that, wow, maybe he just dodged a bullet. I, I was actually, <laughs> I was actually a little bit surprised with Neil because after Harmony leaves, he has lunch with Devon and Lily and Devon accidentally kind of spilled the beans to Lily in front of Neil uh, that you know, that Neil had confessed his feelings for Harmony to Devon, even though Lily had kind of picked up on it anyway. But Neil has the bright idea (laughs) that he's just going to go back to Sophia now and act like nothing ever happened. He actually said that. Maybe I'm just going to go. He said, Sophia was mad about my confession to her about my feelings for Harmony at first, but then she just sort of went back to normal and maybe that's what I should do now. Really? Um, don't you think that that's kind of like putting your head in the sand and just going back to the same type of behaviors that got you into this position in the first place, got you into this loveless marriage in the first place? So I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed. Oh, I'm a lot disappointed that things with Neil and Harmony don't feel like they're going to work out. I mean, of course it was too good. Of course there was going to be a bump in the road, but I think Sophia deserves better than this. I think both of them deserve better than what they're getting in this loveless marriage. But I was very, very impressed with <laughs> Sophia this week. She ran into Harmony at the athletic club, and she threw big shade, big shade at Harmony. (laughs) She was, she said something like, well, rumors fly fast through this town, and you've already ruined one marriage, and you better not make it two. And oh, in case I'm not being clear, stay away from Neil. (laughs) It was good. And I love seeing Sophia be aggressive. I'm like, you know what? Go ahead, girl. Fight for your man. Get dirty if you have to. I don't care. Just do something other than be vanilla, other than be completely bland. It was just nice to see Sophia step up and fight for what she wants, even if I don't think that she and Neil are necessarily meant to be. It was kind of weird, too, because then later... Neil and Sophia talked back at the apartment and she said something to him like, you can't see what's right in front of you. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to you. I thought, well, no, not really. (laughs) I mean, yeah, you're a really good mother and wife and everything, but the best thing probably that ever happened to Neil was Drew. You're just not going to be able to take that place. He has high standards, I think. That's why he really hasn't been able to make it work with anyone since Drew. She was the best thing that ever happened to him. So I love you, Sophia, but I felt like that was a little bit of an overstatement. (sighs) I think that maybe now Neil's going to try to give it a shot with Sophia, but it's all out. It's She's like a runner-up prize, and they both deserve better than that. Now, what ticked me off this week, you guys... I don't, I hope, I wonder if I'm alone in feeling this, but Devon really laid in to Tucker and Harmony when he found out what had happened. He 
I wanted to smack him. Devon goes over to Tucker's apartment slash office, calls Harmony there too, and has the nerve to stand there chastising both of his parents. He's telling them about how disappointed he is in them, and I thought we were actually getting somewhere, being the family. And I'm like, who does Devon think he is? Chastising them for their mistakes. They're their mistakes. Doesn't have anything to do with you, Devon. He goes out of his way to try to make it all about him as if he's the victim here. Give me a break. <laughs> I understand that you're disappointed, you know, but they're human beings. <laughs> As how they act in their personal lives, in their personal relationships, has nothing to do with how they feel about their son. That's just immature. That that, that was his reaction was just immature. I could see talking to them, telling them that you're disappointed and encouraging them to do what they need to do in order to make it right. But getting all ticked off at them and acting all offended and taking it personally, it it was just straight up immature. And it all that it really accomplished was pushing Harmony to the brink. She was already hating herself, already feeling horrible and knowing that the one person whose opinion she cares more about than anyone now hates her, it just really set her over the edge. She goes to Jimmy's, but she shouldn't have even been there anyway. But she's a social butterfly. <laughs> Harmony likes to be out amongst the public. She goes to Jimmy's for a ginger ale, and she runs into an old dealer, I guess, some an old somebody who she used to score from, and he sees her there and tries right off the bat to offer her drugs. And then I don't know, she's so she's so strong in some ways and so weak in others because she managed to tell him, no, no, I don't do that stuff anymore. And then he goes, Well why don't you come sit down with me anyway? And she's like, yeah, all right. Hello, Harmony, you can't even let the devil in a little bit. If you let him in a little bit, you might, you know, he'll work his way in. That's what he's looking for. And they sit down at the table, and the dealer guy offers her a freebie. He just happens to have a bag on him, and he does this sly little sliding it around the edge of the table thing to her, like, here's a taste for free, just for old times, which... Thank goodness her better senses came over her because, hello, he's just trying to make money. That's how he makes money. He gives you one taste and then you need another taste and another. And even if he's given it to you for free the first time, he's going to make money off you later. So I'm very proud of her that she was not weak enough to fall for that crap. And I was also really glad to see just off in the distance as this is happening sitting at the bar having a burger is Sarge. And Sarge, his ears go up. <laughs> he realizes that there's a damsel in distress. And he wa he witnesses the whole thing and then walks over to Harmony and says, I'm proud of you. I'm really glad that you didn't end up doing that, but I think maybe you might need to go to a, a meeting. You know, you might need to just... <sighs> shake it off and let me help you. Let me be there for you too. And they walked off and, and as friends, you know, and I thought that that was probably the first sign of an actual relationship maybe happening between Sarge and Harmony. So I'm sure for fans that knew both of the actors when they were on, I think it was AMC, I want to say, uh, that's a real treat, you know? And so it's definitely a possibility. If, if we work on Harmony and Sarge a little bit more, I think that I could possibly get into them. It just depends. It just depends on how it all unfolds. <sighs> Tucker and Ashley, though, still feeling very hopeless. I, you know, I was actually very impressed with Billy this week on a couple of levels. I've been mad at Billy for <laughs> months, <laughs> but I've 
just have been kind of impressed with him this week. He found out about everything happening with Ashley and Tucker's marriage, and he went to visit her. And instead of jumping on the bandwagon with Ashley and Jack all wanting to grab their torches and beat up Tucker or string him up or whatever they all wanted to do, Billy actually tried to give Ashley a little bit of perspective as someone who had been a cheater. You know, he realized that he had cheated on Victoria, and if Victoria hadn't given him a second chance, then he wouldn't be where he is today. So he actually talked a little bit to Ashley, a little bit of sense into her. He gave her a little bit of perspective, which was probably what she wanted to hear, because I think deep down, Ashley really wants to go back to him. I think she really wants to believe that he's changed. Um, I was proud of Billy for having a different take on things and also for suggesting that she might need to see a therapist. <laughs> we all know <laughs> that Ashley uh, has had a history of mental problems and shoot, it was it was at, right at the end of her last breakdown that she met Tucker and he helped her through her last breakdown when when she had to give up faith. So Billy really chimed in there and helped out this week. And I really, truly appreciated that. And I thought, oh my gosh, maybe he's going to talk her to going back to Tucker. And I really think that maybe it would have worked if Ashley hadn't walked in on part two of a Harmony and Tucker moment, intimate moment. Ashley goes, back to Tucker's apartment slash office to go pick up some of her things. And I think that she was going to try to talk to him. She had called him beforehand and he said, I have some things I really want to tell you. And I think that uh, that whole scene could have gone so much differently. They could have had a really good conversation. He could have explained himself. But instead, she walked in in the moment just after Devon had ripped them a new one. Harmony is devastated. She is crying. And Tucker is standing behind her. You can tell that he doesn't really want to comfort her. I don't... I think Tucker... Tucker's not being mean toward her. I mean, she did... He doesn't blame her, I guess is the point. He could easily be a jerk and blame Harmony for what happened, but he's taking full responsibility. And you could tell that he doesn't feel particularly close toward her, but he just saw someone crying, someone who needed someone. And so he kind of embraced her. He just gave her a little bit of a hug. And of course, that's exactly when... Ashley walked in and it all just went to hell. It seemed, you know, it rang Ashley's rang in Ashley's mind a, a like a repeat of what she had walked in on last week or in YNR time a couple of days ago. And here again, now Harmony feels like she's the other woman again, just sends her spiraling further down. And Tucker's just like, crap, <laughs> crap, <laughs> again. <laughs> Anyway, Ashley just goes into the bedroom, gets her, gets a few of her things, and storms out, and it just is another hit and miss. But you gotta kind of give Harmony a little bit of credit, too, because she tried to approach Ashley later on. She actually went to Abby's house to talk to Ashley and try to pave, you know, smooth, smooth out the road for Tucker, but it just made it worse. Ashley is absolutely determined to move on with her life. She doesn't want to hear what Harmony has to say. She doesn't want to hear what anybody has to say. And I'm, it is really, it's so annoying because I know that Eileen Davidson is leaving the show. So I'm, I am enjoying every last minute of seeing Ashley on screen. But I'm worried, too, because I wonder if she's leaving, does that mean that Tucker is leaving, too? I, I don't know what he's going to do if she's not around. So I don't know what this means for him. I just don't know what this means for anyone. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that Ashley is going to be back in the fall. Someone made a really, really good point to me last week uh, that 
it may just be that YNR is trying to make room in the summer for some younger storylines, you know, hence Fen and Summer being aged, because that's when kids are out of school. That's when they can hook younger viewers on the show. That's when I got hooked. I was on summer vacation uh, from school. Like, I guess it was the end of grade school. I was probably like in eighth grade or something. I was home for summer vacation and I just started watching my NR and Hey, I've become a 16, I don't know, shoot 16, 17, something like that year fan. So may, it may just be that they're trying to save a little salary so that they can focus on some younger stuff over the summer. And then maybe just maybe my fingers are freaking crossed that they'll bring Ashley back in the fall, but for now, this is probably part of the exit strategy. I think it's gonna, it's pretty much gonna be a multiple choice. I think, <laughs> let's play a game here. What do you think it's gonna be? How is Ashley going to exit the show? Because I think it's either going to be A, Ashley will go to New York to stay with Tracy since she's so distraught over everything that's happened with Tucker. Or B, she'll have a complete mental breakdown and <laughs> have to go away for months and months of therapy. Or C, <laughs> she'll take a business trip. She'll decide to focus in on business, as the Newmans and the Abbots often do. Probably the business trip will be to Japan, so that she can continue to try to get Jabot in those Japanese stores. And who knows, maybe it could play into some kind of beauty of nature thing. Maybe when she comes back, she'll be the new owner of Beauty of Nature. Who knows? You guys, you'll have to leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about Ashley's exit, how it's going to happen, and what your feelings on all of this stuff are. Boy, there were some really good scenes with Victoria and Billy and Victor and Nikki this week. I liked Billy and Victoria more this week than I have in a while. Um, it was really cute to see Victor opening himself up to having a relationship with his grandson, even though it isn't his biological grandson. I mean... Victoria sees little Johnny as nothing less than her son. So I think it says that Victor is trying, he's trying to mend his relationship with his daughter by doing the same thing, seeing Johnny as her son and therefore as his grandson. So it was cute to see the big man with a little baby. <laughs> but more importantly, I thought that Victoria and Victor had some really good a really good conversation. They, it was both sweet and very frank. Victoria had Nikki there as well, and she was kind of, kind of uh, calling calling them all out. And you know, she said to Victor, "Hey, you don't like my relation." I you know no, she said, "I don't like your relationship with Sharon. You don't like my relationship with Billy." So I guess we're even, but the difference is I wouldn't hire someone to come between you and Sharon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is the difference. And I thought it was good that she got that in. And I kind of felt that maybe it sunk in a little bit when she said that. Victor acts like he don't hear anything she's saying, but I think he did. And there was this wonderful scene also where Victor was still there at Victoria's house, but he went out back to make a phone call and Billy got home and he approached Victoria and he said, you know, talking to Ashley made me think about Myanmar, you know, when he had cheated and when he did what he did, when he abandoned his daughter and his family and ran off to Myanmar, like the little weasel that he can be. <laughs> and he said to Victoria, I realized that what happened in Myanmar wasn't all Victor's fault. It wasn't just him. It was me too. And for the first time, I realized why Victor hates me so much. That was an incredible moment because I realized why Victor hates him so much. <laughs> Billy, can he really ticks me off. I mean, so does Victor. 
but he really ticks me off. And I thought it was a very nice maturing moment that Billy kind of realized that. And as soon as he said that, Victor walked in (laughs) from off making his phone call and he just kind of, Victor kind of just politely excused himself. And as soon as Victor left the house, Billy was like, please don't tell me that Victor heard me say that. I didn't even know he was here. And flash, flash to Victor standing out on the front stoop, kind of going, hmm. So it was just, that was such a good scene. And it made me think, is this a new day for Victoria and Victor's relationship? Is it possible that that just even in witnessing that little scene between Billy and Victoria, Victor will start to see what it is also that is lovable about Billy. You know, it's very obvious the reasons why Billy is a screw up, but there are also reasons why he's a good father and a good husband. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, Victor is starting to see that. Now, there was also some, I felt, negative negative things happening with Billy and Victoria this week. Because, you guys, Billy and Victoria promised Chelsea a relationship with the kid as a condition of her signing over her parental rights. Basically, Billy and Victoria promised her anything that she wanted in order to get her to sign over her parental rights. And now that the baby's born and they're settling into their little life, they want her out. They have no intention of honoring that. You can tell. It's annoying to me because I can see how that kid might resent one day that his mom was shut out of his life. Sure, Chelsea decided to give him up, but still, it really, I think it's really annoying. So, Billy and Victoria go to visit Chelsea to try to push her along. It, hopefully, they like to push her right out of Genoa City. And she tells them, hey, you know what? Look, it's fine. I might someday want to be involved in the child's life, but I don't right now. And you could just see this huge sigh of relief on Billy and Victoria's face. And I just, you know, I can understand why they wouldn't want her to be part of her life. But then don't lie and say that you do. Or promise her that she can be. They're being two-faced is, I guess, the point that I'm getting at. And I don't know. Frankly, I just I kind of wish Chelsea would go away, too. I know, I know there are definitely some Chelsea and Adam fans developing out there. And I'm just not one of them. I just can't get there. Chelsea has decided that she wants to go straight. She didn't accept Victor's $10 million offer, and she told Billy and Victoria that she no longer wants to be their responsibilities. So she's going to go out, get her own job, which means she's going to have to get out of her hotel room. She's no longer going to be able to pay that bill. And upon hearing this, Adam decides to ask Chelsea to move in with him. Mm. If my tonsils weren't sore and swollen, I would probably scream right now. I just don't like it. I just don't like it. It's too soon. It's too much. Yes, Adam and Chelsea have things in common, and that is very cute. They have, they like the same movies. It's cute to see them watching movies and having popcorn. And the truth is, I really like seeing this softer side of Adam. I love hearing his stories. I like I like learning more about the things that he likes. He, Adam actually told the story of how he knew that he was going to want to be involved in business, and he knew it ever since he was a child. But he, he told the story of how there was a farmhand uh, that uh, worked on the farm where he grew up and who taught him how to play chess, and he would go off to school. I guess they would only do like one move per day. Adam would go off to school, and he would rush home to make his chess move and and then the farmhand would reciprocate and he 
almost never won, but he enjoyed the challenge and he enjoyed thinking about it. And I thought that was such a great story, which is something we never heard from him before. I I love Adam. I love the character of Adam. And I think someone put it best, absolutely perfectly. Uh, Someone left me a comment last week that said, you know, the problem is, who is Chelsea to just come out of nowhere and take the prize that is Adam. He's like one of the best characters on the show. He's at this point probably the most eligible bachelor. And if he can't be with Sharon, all right, I'll deal with it. But then this Chelsea comes out of nowhere. She was such a scuzzo character. Just scuzz when she first came on. The level of treachery what she did with billy was is just gross and then getting up in their marriage and trying to break them up and just gross and now all of a sudden who is she to come and take the best guy on the show i just don't think so it would have had to be like it would have had to have been like chloe or i don't know somebody i at least liked to be with adam <laughs> she's just not good enough for adam <laughs> That's my point. <laughs> Adam is like the worst of the worst, and I'm like, she's not good enough for him. <sighs> I'm very disappointed that he has decided to move in with her. I personally think that Adam just doesn't want to be alone. I think that he misses Sharon more than he wants to let on, and he just doesn't want to be without her. I think that he sees Sharon moving on, and he's going to tit for tat, and Sharon of course, happened to be walking down the hall at the same time as Adam was helping Chelsea move her things into his hotel room. And Sharon's like, whoa, are you two moving in together? And Adam is like, why, yes, yes, we are. And Chelsea goes away and Adam and Sharon have this moment together and basically say, well, it's over. Adam straight up said that. He said, if you're thinking that there's going to be anything left between us, you're wrong. There's not. I'm moving on. I like Chelsea. She's fun. She brings out something different in me. And you're obviously moved on. So this is just needs to be goodbye. And it felt like such a goodbye. He was so cold about it. This is what ticks me off. Adam Turn, you know, after that happens, we see nothing more from Adam. After the goodbye, he just leaves. But we see this sh- scene of Sharon. Tr- she's holding back tears. And as soon as he turned around and closes the door, she can hardly hold the tears in her eyes anymore. She just kind of runs off. But we see nothing from him. So we can clearly see that Sharon still loves Adam. But I am not seeing any remorse from him. I need to see some signs that he still loves her. <laughs> I want that relationship to come back, but it just sure don't look like it is because as soon as that incident happened, it just sent Sharon running right back into Victor's arms. You gotta hand it to Peter Bregman. This storyline with Jack in the chair, not being able to walk. It has been a bum storyline, but Peter Bergman has played it out the whole way. He has given 100% in all of these scenes, even though it's kind of sappy. It's kind of, it's kind of predictable. <laughs> He still really plays it all the way. This week, or at the end of last week, he thought he felt something. He thought he felt his toe move. And very unfortunately, he calls the doctors and they tell him, Hey, sorry to tell you this, buddy, but it probably was nothing. It was probably a phantom thing. It, you know, it's kind of um, akin to when a someone who's lost a limb swears that they still feel it there as if what he was feeling was just a memory of being able to feel his feet or his toes or have feelings in his feet and legs and he was very very disappointed upon hearing that he had one moment of feeling hope and gosh you could see it in Peter's eyes like he played it so good i he believed it even though i just think seeing jack in the chair sucks. The actor just really, he brings it no matter what. You you feel it. And he was so 
hopeful in one moment and then completely dashed when the doctors told him that. And luckily, Billy was there to give him this incredible pep talk. I'm, I was very impressed with Billy this week. He's, he's, he's getting back on my good side because Jack was starting to get all negative, like, I'm never going to walk, blah, blah, blah. And Billy really encouraged him. He pulled out the old, you're John Abbott's son card, (laughs) which always works, and just tried to give him a reason to keep going. He was a little bit tough on Jack, and and it just, it worked though. It, it, I felt like it was a really good moment between the two brothers and it gave Jack a reason to keep going. And then he still has other reasons to keep going because Abby actually talked Kyle into going to see his father this week. Kyle, Kyle is, is annoying <laughs> to me. He's cute and he's charming, but he's just too loud. He's loud in everything he does. He's loud and big and he's so like Mr. Charming. See, I'm just not like that. That's just not my kind of guy. I like a, I like a more subtle guy. He's just too over the top for me. And by the way, like Kyle and Abby in scenes together is like over the top, (laughs) just extraordinaire. It's very, it's very annoying to be honest, because <laughs> Abby's kind of Abby's been on my nerves lately too. She's just so she's just I want I want her to be more mature. I don't know. And then Kyle really needs to be more mature. Them together is insane. But I was proud of her for talking him into going to see his father. And um, most importantly, Kyle saw how hard Jack is trying. And he decided to give Jack his blessing to be with Nikki. And I think that Jack needs Nikki right now. And Nikki needs Jack right now. I am more open to Nikki and Jack every day. The, it's, the more things get convoluted with Nikki and Victor, the more I want Nikki and Jack to get together. I'm just... I'm I'm tired of the mess and Jack is a very positive person. Nikki needs that. Nikki is a very positive person. Jack needs that. And I was though pretty surprised by Jack's marriage proposal to Nikki. Don't you think that's a little bit soon? <laughs> I appreciate that their relationship is happening, but marriage is kind of quick. Maybe you should date a little bit more. But right there in the exercise room, Jack's like, marry me. And of course, it's uh, as Jack is asking Nikki to marry him, who should walk in but Victor. Victor had decided at the behest of Catherine to give it one more try with Nikki. And as soon as he tries to do that, he witnesses the marriage proposal, and he sees Nikki kissing Jack. But of course, Victor doesn't hear the whole conversation because Nikki was like, I love you. And this is, you know, I, I feel, I feel for you. And then Victor walks away and she's like, but I need to think about it. Of course, Victor doesn't hear that part of it. He just goes back home with open arms for Sharon, who has just said goodbye to Adam and is ready to throw herself into Victor's arms. And as soon, this is just ridiculous, as soon as Victor and Sharon get a little romantic, a desperate romantic moment going on, what do you know? Nikki walks in on that. It was so ridiculous. It's so freaking ridiculous. First of all, Nikki should stop walking into the ranch like she still lives there. (laughs) That would save her a lot of trouble. Second of all, I am just so tired of this hit and miss. It is ridiculous. Victoria actually really called it out this week. She really summarized my feelings. She had Victor and Nikki in the room together and she just said, it's always an eye for an eye. You do something, you know, Victor does something to tick Nikki off. So Nikki, so Nikki does something to tick Victor off. And it was exactly that, like the whole hit and miss thing this week with Victor overhearing 
Nikki and Jack and the marriage proposal, and just five minutes later, Nikki walking in on Victor and Sharon. It, I'm so tired of it. When will it stop? When are you two going to just work it out or call it off? And even Catherine was saying the exact same thing this week. And I feel like just call it off then. If you can't make it work for the millionth time, just call it off because even I'm getting sick of it. I would love to be a for life Victor and Nikki fan and I'm done. I am. I really am. I have no hopes for them getting back together. I'm not going to cry about it. At this point, I want Nikki and Jack to live happily ever after. And if Victor wants to be with Sharon, that's fine. You know what? That's fine. But just stop playing games. I mean, Catherine also said this week, someone's going to get hurt. You always do this and someone's going to get hurt. I don't want it to be Jack. He's already in a wheelchair. And I don't want it to be Sharon either. Just, you know, what, you know what it is? In the end, the only ones who are getting hurt are the viewers. Okay, YNR, give us a break. We can only run in these circles so long before we just give up. Well, Daisy sobered up real quick when she saw Daniel sucking face with Eden. <laughs> oh my goodness. Daisy walked in on this scene between Daniel and Eden, and together, pretty much she and Phyllis reined in that leash that they have him on, and he got out real, real quick. D Daniel is half a man at this point. He's married to this crazy woman. His mother is so incredibly overbearing. She has way too much control over his life. He doesn't have any control over anything anymore, and I kind of can't help but feel sorry for the guy. My goodness, it's not as if he slept with Daisy on purpose and had this situation happen. The whole situation was thrust upon him. And uh, I just, Phyllis is so incredible. She's trying to talk him out of the marriage and he's determined. And I got to believe that he has some kind of plan going on just by some of the looks that he's given this week. I got to believe that he knows what he's doing on one level or another, but Phyllis is crazy normally. <laughs> now that she's pregnant, it's like, wow, I didn't think that it could get any more crazy. She is on turbo charge. She's all over the place. She's angry, then she's happy. She is vicious, then she's hungry, <laughs> then she's horny. It's just she's everywhere. She's all over the place. And I would not want to be in her line of fire for nothing. But... Daniel, I think it's all out of love with Daniel. He has decided that he wants to move out of Daisy's apartment and go back to his studio, back to the place of conception, back to the place where she raped him, essentially, and got pregnant. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what his plan is. Why would they want to live in a cozy one-bedroom apartment in a nice building when they could just move into his dingy studio. It's more cramped. <laughs> I think would think he would want to get his space from her, but it seems like he's planning on getting more space uh, just by being outside of the apartment. He actually grabbed Lucy this week and, and said, we're going to go on a Daddy and Lucy drive. They totally left Daisy out of the picture. And she's like, where are you going? And he goes, someplace I should have gone a long time ago. Next thing we know, Daniel shows up backstage at a Danny Romilotti concert. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! I was so, so happy to see Danny. Are you guys as excited as I am about that? I kept waiting all week. There were various moments where in my head I'm like, ooh, is this, is where, is this where Danny's going to appear? Because <laughs> Phyllis was on the phone with him at one point and I was like, ooh, maybe he's going to actually already be in town and there's going to be a surprise. I'm just waiting. Oh, just, it's so good for 
nostalgia's sake. I, I love that we're going back to the part where Phyllis was crazy. I love it. I can't wait for it. It's going to be so cool. And there's so many parallels between the situation with Daisy and Daniel as there were with Phyllis and Danny. It's pretty much the exact same situation. Even admittedly, Phyllis pulled Daisy aside this week and said, I've been down this path that you're traveling on. I have tried to keep a man by using my kid. She even said it like that. She even straight up said, I used Daniel to try to get Danny. And Daisy's like, oh, well, that's not what's going to happen to me. But it is. And that scene that Daisy walked in on at Jimmy's with Daniel and Eden, get ready for a lifetime of that. You know, Sophia could probably take that same uh, lesson too. Not that Sophia is using Moses or anything, but just, it's true. You can't make a man love you. Take it from Phyllis. She went all out. There ain't no, there ain't nothing. There ain't no scheme that Daisy could pull that will be more outrageous than what Phyllis has already pulled. So get used to it, Daisy, really. And never results in getting the guy. And so I just, I love it. I love that it's being taken back YNR retro style. And I swear to you, the moment that I saw Danny flying down the, from those steps, like with a little bit of sweat after his show, I got giddy like one of his fans. Everything with Ricky is starting to really ramp up. Ricky's a threat to so many people. It, he His threats at least sprawl across three lives. There's Phyllis, there's Daisy, and there's Eden. And first, I guess, with Phyllis, man, early in the week, there was this scene where I think Phyllis had just been done visiting Daniel and Daisy's apartment, which is right across the hall from where he had, where Ricky had just moved out of Eden's apartment. And Phyllis steps into the elevator and Ricky steps in right after her. And there's this moment between them where I think she felt a little afraid and Ricky instantly snapped into intimidation mode. He hit the emergency button on the elevator and they were both locked in and you just got the sense that he could stab her to death or something in that moment just if he wanted to. And then he unhits the button and says, oh, I thought I forgot my key. Oh, it's so creepy and so good. It's so creepy and so good. I love that scene. That was probably the scene of the week for me. He's so subtle with his creepiness, but yet so obvious. He wants you to know that he could get you if he wanted to. Oh my goodness. Ah. And then there's Daisy. He actually goes over to Daisy's house and threatens to tell a judge that she had him kidnap Lucy in order to get full custody. Uh, you didn't actually think, Daisy, that doing a deal with the devil was going to have you still get off scot-free. Of course, he was always going to call in that favor. He was always going to want something in return. And what he got in return this time was to take her apartment. It, <laughs> it sounds like she's paying for it, too. It seems like it's not just that he's renting it. I think she's I got the impression that Daisy's paying for him to stay there, which is exactly what he wants because it puts him right across the hall from Eden. So now Ricky's living in the place where Daisy used to live and Eden is living alone in her apartment with Crazy Boy right across the hall. I think Eden is in the most trouble of all these people. I just think that Eden... It's really not looking good for her. She don't seem like she has anybody to protect her either. And it's kind of a shame because I actually, after this week, I like Eden more than I really ever have. I think it's I think it's the feud between she and Abby <laughs> that's, that's really funny to me. It just every time they run into each other, it's kind of, it's throwing insults back and forth. And it's funny. I like watching them dig at each other because they're very opposite. Eden is such an artistic 
kind of a smarty know-it-all girl and Abby is ditzy blonde but rich and you know full of herself and so they make really good enemies the only problem is that a handful of peanuts isn't going to stop Ricky I think Eden needs way more help than that (laughs) Ricky oh man he's so he's so bad he let himself into Eden's apartment after he had already moved out. She's in the apartment. She hears, oh, can you imagine how freaky this would be? She's in the apartment. She hears the key turn and then Creepo walks right in and locks the door behind him. He is so, that's the technique. He, it's a subtle intimidation technique that he just knows how to do. He's just learned it along the way and he just pulls it on her and he acts like it's all fine, like he's just there to return the key. But girl should have changed the locks because he returned the key, but he showed later in the episode that he still has one. So he has complete access to Eden anytime, anytime when he wants to. And Eden ran into Paul this week, and she tried to lightly share the information with him that his son is a psycho without making Paul feel bad. And Paul agreed that Eden needs to stay far, far away from Ricky, because this week, Paul got some perspective that he wasn't expecting. Paul goes to visit Ricky's ex-girlfriend's best friend. So the parting line, I guess, is that Ricky's ex-girlfriend, after they broke up, committed suicide. And Paul goes to try to find out more information. He thinks, oh, well, maybe this will give me some insight into my son. (coughs) It'll help me figure out why he is the way he is. And when he finds the best friend of the girl, the best friend says, I'm so glad this is the twist it took. She says, I don't believe it was a suicide at all. There's something wrong with Ricky. I believe that he did something to her. Of course, she doesn't have any proof, which is good for the storyline, I think. So he's not going to go down for it, but it still is enough to create doubt, especially in Paul's mind, which is such a hard pill for Paul to swallow. He's realizing that his son is dangerous. (sighs) He heads back to Genoa City after this, and he's lamenting at the bar having a drink when who should walk in but Christine... And Christine knows exactly what it's like to be on the receiving end of psychoticness. She had it with Phyllis, and she had it with Isabella, Ricky's mother. And Christine was actually trying to defend Ricky a little bit. Paul was confiding in her that he was afraid Ricky turned out just like his mother. And Christine was like, well, you don't really know. It it might not be. You can't really tell. She She was trying to cushion the blow a little bit, but... I don't know, Christine better look out too. Because for all we know, Ricky could be trying to carry out his mother's vendetta. Now that Christine's back in town, Ricky could want to get in on her too. She she could he could just add her to the list. What little intimidation technique will he have for her? I love this. <laughs> I just love it. I love that it is drudging up Ricky's past. I love that it is drudging up Phyllis's past. And I I love that it's bringing both Danny and Christine back onto the scene. This is so cool. I just hope that when all this is said and done, I mean, we know something is going to happen. Somebody's going to go down and Ricky's going to be responsible for it. I just hope when it's all said and done that we get to keep Ricky on the show. <laughs> He's just bringing such a good element of bad and I I can't help myself. I want him in every episode from now on. Okay, you guys, that's gonna do it for me for this week. My throat definitely hurts more than when I started. (laughs) This probably wasn't the best idea in my healing process, but I can't let a week go by, especially not a week like this, without saying my piece. (laughs) 
I will fight through. I'll just not talk for the next couple days. I've talked more. This is always how it is. I talk more on Sunday than I do the rest of the week combined. And that's not even a lie. That's, that's, I bet you. (laughs) But I will take the next couple of days and I will try to recover. I hope that you still enjoyed the podcast um, and the, or the audio. (laughs) the no video. I hope that you enjoy it even though there was no video and even though I probably, it's maybe a little bit lower on the audio than normal, but um, still, if you listen hard, it's still there. I'm still here. And if anybody has any amazing home remedies for tonsillitis, I would love to hear it. (laughs) Or if you just want to leave me a comment and tell me what you're thinking about all of this week's show. There's so much. Oh my goodness. There are any number of storylines you can comment on, so pick one or pick all, and be sure to leave me a comment and let me know what you guys are thinking. You can also go to my blog if you want to leave me a comment there or just check that out. Um, there's, you know, I always post the week's video and audio there. Um, the, the, <coughs> sorry, the web address is yrchat blog dot blogspot dot com. I always look forward to hearing from you guys. It's so good. You're my you're all my friends and I love you so much. I hope everybody has an awesome week. I'll be thinking of you and I hope you're thinking of me and sending me some get well wishes. <laughs> But I'm sure I'll be back next week much healthier. I, I, I'm sure I'll be better by next week. And you'll hear me all big and loud again. And I'll be excited for that. So everybody take care. Have an awesome week. Mwah. Love ya. Bye.